Hi, I'm Joshua Hartzorn from Boston College, and today I'll be discussing semantic bootstrapping. As has long been established, life is literally too short for infants to learn in a sentence-by-sentence fashion how to distinguish grammatical utterances from ungrammatical utterances, and how to map the grammatical ones onto their intended meanings. The only option is to learn generalized productive procedures. Unfortunately, the wrong generalizations are almost as bad as no generalizations, since you'll undergeneralize, overgeneralize, or just generally produce gibberish. So, a core scientific question about language acquisition is how do children end up with the right generalizations? In this video, I'll be outlining a theory um, that was first proposed by Jane Grimshaw and then uh, extensively developed by Steve Pinker in the 1980s, um, which to this day remains one of the most comprehensive and well-specified accounts of language um, acquisition. So there's a basic chicken and egg problem in language acquisition. That is, it would be fairly straightforward to explain how the infant learns the semantics of language if she already knew the syntax. Alternatively, it's not too hard to work out a theory of how the infant learns the syntax if she already knows what all the sentences mean. So another way of putting this is that language contains a lot of latent structure, a lot of hidden structure that's not there on the surface. So in an objective sense, dog bites man and man bites dog are really only different in the order of the sounds. But of course, they mean something different, and the infant has to learn that they mean something different and learn which means what. Now to do this, among the various things she has to learn is that bite is a verb um, that describes an action, the action of biting, and that the biter is the subject of that verb, and the bitee, the thing getting bitten, is the object of that verb. Of course, that's not enough either, because she has to know what the subject is and what the object is. So she has to learn for English that the subject is usually um, a noun that comes before the verb and agrees with the verb, the object usually comes after the verb, doesn't agree with the verb, but if she was learning Russian, she'd have to learn something different. Their word order matters a bit less, and you figure out what the subject and object is by looking at the endings of the nouns. And again, the question is, how does the infant discover all of that latent structure, given that it's not there in the input, it's not there in the sounds themselves? It'd be a little bit easier to explain if this was really just a decoding problem. She already knew basically what was being talked about, she already knew how um, concepts are divided up into words, and she's just trying to figure out how is this stuff coded in the actual speech stream. But how does the infant know what words mean? How does she know what's being talked about? It turns out that to learn that, she'd be in a much better position if she already knew the syntax. So if she could recognize nouns and verbs and subjects and objects, she could use a process called syntactic bootstrapping, which I'll be talking about in a different video, to infer what words mean and infer what's being talked about. But now we're in a position where she needs to know syntax in order to learn the semantics, but we said she needed to know the semantics in order to learn the syntax. So we need a way of breaking that circle. Pinker argued that if some parts of the puzzle were already known, the infant could bootstrap her way into the rest. So he posited that at the outset of acquisition, the infant already has an inventory of syntactic categories as well as under specified phrase structure rules that are going to need some specification. So she knows maybe that sentences can be composed of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase or a verb phrase followed by a noun phrase and she just doesn't know the order yet. So what do these um, syntactic structures map onto? Well, it could be holistic representations of events, but most linguists have argued that to correctly account for adult language, there needs to be an intermediate, more abstract representation of meaning. Pinker argued that, or really he posited, that this too was innate. Specifically, he proposed that prelinguistic infants are already equipped with the abstract compositional semantic structures invoked in the theories of Ray Jackendoff, Beth Levine, and others. Representations involving abstract categories such as object and action and agent and cause and goal. So, for instance, in this first one in the top left, you have something causing some other thing to have a property. So, for instance, bleach causing laundry to be white, or the moon causing the earth to have tides. Even with innate syntactic and semantic structure, it's not clear how to learn which of the infinite possible mappings between them is the right one. So, how do we map the semantic structures on the syntactic structures? Pinker argued that this could be surmounted if infants know how a few of the semantic representations map onto a few of the syntactic representations. For instance, Pinker posited that infants expect objects to be labeled by nouns. To see how this helps, 
Consider what happens when she hears, for instance, the dog is barking. Suppose she's learned that the word dog means dog. Now, given the innate linking rule, the infant knows that dog is a noun because the names of objects are nouns. Of course, it's not necessarily vice versa. Not all nouns are going to name objects, such as the destruction of Rome. Destruction is a noun, but it's not an object. But names of objects, like dog, are nouns on this theory. Now, given a few other similar cases, she can infer how nouns are marked in her language by noticing some patterns. So one cue in English is that nouns frequently follow the words the or a. And now she can use that to identify nouns uh, that don't refer to objects, such as destruction, we, which we already mentioned, but you know, truth, justice, in the American way. So she notices that we talk about the destruction, and so destruction is noun. Pinker dubbed this theory semantic bootstrapping because you're using syntax to grab hold of a piece of syntax, learn that piece, and then use that knowledge to learn the rest of syntax. So you're pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. Pinker proposed that there are many innate rules linking semantics to syntax. So in addition to the rule that says that the names of objects will be nouns, there's a rule that says that actions are going to be described by verbs. In the exact same way, the infant can learn how subjects are marked in her language by leveraging an expectation that agents have caused events should appear as subjects of verbs. Suppose, for instance, the infant's father says, the cat broke the vase. And let's say that by this point, the infant already knows what the word cat means. Now, if it so happens that the infant can guess from context that her father is talking about this really salient event that just happened in which the cat broke the vase, she's now in a position to learn something. Because the cat is the thing causing the event, from the innate linking rule, she knows that cat has to be the subject of this sentence. If this kind of thing happens multiple times, she'll be able to pick up on some patterns. For instance, in English, subjects usually come before the verb. And again, once she's learned how to identify subjects syntactically, she'll be able to use that to parse sentences that aren't about caused events. Notice that this means that the infant now knows um, whether the subject comes before or after verbs, which was one of the phrase structure rules that we needed to specify. Through such learning, the infant ultimately determines both how semantic structures um, map onto syntactic structures, but also the appropriate phrase structure rules of her language, allowing her to formulate adult syntactic uh, structures. Another problem that Pinker addressed is how the infant learns the syntactic rules that govern how a verb is used in a sentence. That you can say Beatrice ate fish, but not Beatrice dined fish. And that you can say the vase broke, but not the vase hit. Naively, you might think the child just notices which verbs get used in which frames and assumes that if she hasn't heard a given verb in a given frame, it just doesn't go. But with thousands of verbs and hundreds of syntactic frames, there's a good chance that you wouldn't hear a completely legal verb construction combination merely by chance. So how do you distinguish, based on the input, impossible combinations from merely unusual ones, avoiding both undergeneralization and overgeneralization? So any given verb can be used syntactically in a number of different ways. So you could say the cat broke the vase, where you have a subject and a direct object, or just the vase broke, where you have only a subject and no direct object. Now on this theory, this amounts to saying that any given verb is compatible with multiple semantic frames. And which ones those are is still something that the child is going to have to learn. What Pinker argues is that there are rules that tell you given that you're compatible with one particular frame, what other frames you might be compatible with. So for instance, it's typically the case in English that if a verb can describe one thing going along a path from one state to another state, so the vase broke, it went from not being broken to being broken, then that verb can also be used to describe one thing causing another thing to go along a path from one state to another state. So the cat broke the vase. The cat caused the vase to now be broken. So the theory is complex, but hopefully you see how it simplifies the learning problem for the child. Instead of the child having to figure out for each verb which of the many different syntactic constructions that verb is compatible with, the child has to learn some general rules about mappings between semantics and syntax, and then identify for each verb at least one semantic frame that it can, that it's compatible with. So it took Pinker two long, dense books to lay out the theory of semantic bootstrapping. I've spent about 10 minutes, and hopefully that was enough to give you an intuition about 
the structure of the theory, the structure of the arguments. But I've obviously left out a lot of the detail, and I've focused on just a few of the many phenomena that it tries to account for. As I said at the beginning, this is probably the most comprehensive theory of language acquisition that's been produced. And if you want the details, you're going to have to look at the books. Now, of course, just because it's detailed doesn't mean that it's right. There are concerns about and limitations um, for every theory of language acquisition that's been proposed. Semantic bootstrapping is not an exception. In fact, there are probably more concerns about that than the typical theory, precisely because it's so well specified. So I'll finish by describing three of the more common concerns about the theory. One is that it does require that the child, a certain percentage of the time, know what is being talked about. Right? They don't have to understand what's being said, but they do need to know that say their father is talking about a dog in the example that I gave earlier. And even though it doesn't require that to happen all the time and doesn't require that the child know exactly what's being communicated, it may still be a bridge too far. There's a lot of reasons to suspect that's a little unrealistic. A second concern is that the theory requires a lot of syntax to be innate. Not only does the infant have to know that there are nouns and verbs and subjects and objects and so on, but she has to know a lot of things that are true of nouns and verbs and subjects and how they relate to each other and so on. And so not only does this put a lot of strain on our theories of genetics, because all that has to be encoded in the genes somehow, but it also runs afoul of what we've learned since this theory was originally proposed about the variation in languages around the world. So if these properties were innate, we would expect them to appear in all languages, and it turns out there's a lot more variability in the structures of languages than we thought at the time. A final concern that I'll mention is that the theory requires that infants have rich, abstract, conceptual representations. Now, interestingly, over the last 25 years, developmental psychologists have discovered that infants have a number of abstract conceptual representations well before the onset of language acquisition. That said, the vast majority of abstract representations posited by Pinker, um, we have no evidence for. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not there. There's obviously quite a lot about the infant mind that we don't yet understand, but it is a very strong claim um, for which we don't have a lot of evidence, and this gives some people pause. So that's a brief overview of semantic bootstrapping. In other videos, I'm going to be talking about how researchers lately have been trying to build on the ideas of semantic bootstrapping and incorporate ideas from other theoretical approaches. But for now, I'll leave you with that.